Because they always know how to fill in the space, right? Everybody's sort of okay with a little bit of chaos. I'll give you my phone. I have my my wife. Uh, or go to the, the guy in the office across the way. Okay, I want to do a little bit of show and tell. And this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but I was at the Rubin Museum uh, the week before last. And in light of the many studies that are uh, skeptical or celebratory of the history of yoga, I just wanted to read the first couple of sentences from Bhagar's Yoga for Elephants. It starts, I'll get a little closer. Okay. It starts by saying, a few years ago, archaeologists working in a cave several days from Celesteville discovered some paintings of elephants in yoga postures. And what surprised them even more was to find many little clay cylinders with drawings on them. They dated from the earliest times of elephants on the planet, and they also depicted elephants in yoga postures. When the seals were studied in our labs in Celesteville, which means where did yoga really come from? <laughs> Celesteville. <laughs> our scientists could hardly believe their eyes. Not only were elephants capable of performing yoga, it seemed that they had invented it. <laughs> So I invite you, I'm going to put this book out for you to take a look at. It's really quite delightful. And then the second, um, oh, we're almost ready to go, okay, is this book, which I wanted to introduce Devashish Banerjee. Devashish, are you in the room? Okay, you stepped out of the room. Oh, there he is. He is here. Okay. And Devashish Banerjee is uh, deeply associated with Oroville. Uh, this is published by both the press in India and by a local press called Nalanda International, and it's called Sacred Thread, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. It's in shipment, but there will be a display copy, and we will leave a sheet with you. You can write down your email if you're interested. But this is a two-year project with um, students of yoga, uh, myself, Beth Sternweave, and Chris Antunes, and Ben Marshall. And Chris is um, a Brazilian woman who has a long history of practice with yoga. And Beth teaches Iyengar yoga and mindfulness meditation. And then her husband um, does Iyengar yoga and meditation. Also, he was one of the first students of Mr. Guenka. And the book has endorsement by Mr. Iyengar. And what we've done is to do a slight, it's still very accurate, but a slightly simplified version, translation of the Yoga Sutra, and match the Yoga Sutras to images of daily life in India. So I'll have that out there for you to look at. If you're interested, we will send you an email when it becomes available for sale. And two other um, sets of flyers, one a forthcoming grammar book from Again, uh, North Point Press, uh, where every word is a yoga word for the Sanskrit language. I just met with the author who um, did her MA at Columbia and teaches uh, Ashtanga Yoga Studio. And then uh, Stewart's new book, which we have the flyer for, and it's called uh, The Eight Limbs of Yoga, Handbook for Living Yoga Philosophy. Okay, uh, are we all set here? Everything's going? So we can put that okay, there. <laughs>
So thank you very much again, Chris, for uh, inviting me and uh, also for presenting this new evidence for the uh, origin of yoga. <laughs> so it has changed my perspective uh, entirely, and I'm not sure whether uh, what, what I'm going to present here is still credible, but maybe it is. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, asanas and the Patanga the Yoga Shastra, and I'll start uh, yeah, with uh, introducing uh, this uh, presentation a little bit. In this presentation, I shall investigate um, the role and the meaning of postures in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. It is in the oldest surviving systematic exposition of yoga. It was composed uh, probably at some time between 325 and 425 of the Common Era. The Patanjali Yoga Shastra is composed of two different levels of text, as we all know. The first level consists of brief phrases, so-called sutras, that probably are, at least in part, a compilation of uh, older textual materials. Within the Fajanja Yoga Shastra, the sutras frequently serve as starting points for more detailed discussions of relevant topics in the second layer, the so-called Yoga Bhashya. In a recent publication on the historiography of yoga philosophy, I have re-examined the evidence on the authorship question of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra and found that the hypothesis that was first explicitly formulated by Bronkhorst in 1985 probably matches historical facts. According to this hypothesis, the two layers of uh, uh, text so, sorry. Uh, that make up the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, that is its sutra and its Bhashya parts, were probably compiled and composed by a single author as a unified whole. This result is not only um, of uh, historical relevance, it also facilitates the interpretation of the sutras because the information of the Bhasha can be used as an authoritative uh, source that is historically and conceptually in line with the sutras. It is this approach that I shall apply in my presentation, the results of which are partly based on ongoing research on the early history of yoga postures that I conduce together with my friend and colleague Dominic Vujastic. In our joint research, we collected references to postures that are connected with yoga type practices in comparatively early Buddhist, Jaina, and Brahmanic literature. The most fascinating, difficult, and comprehensive account of yoga postures that we have yet worked on is without doubt the reference in the second chapter of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra and its commentaries. In the following main part of my presentation, I shall present this account in its historical and philosophical context and discuss a number of hermeneutical and text critical problems that are related to it. As is well known, the Patanjali Yoga Shastra prescribes a method for achieving liberation from the cycle of rebirths that addresses exclusively male Brahmins. A quite comprehensive account of this method starts in Patanjali Yoga Shastra 229, where the famous eight ancillaries of yoga are listed in the sutra part of the section. There we read. The eight ancillaries consist of commitments, obligations, postures, breath control, withdrawing the senses, fixation, meditation, and absorption. The Sanskrit term anga, which we translate as ancillary, has the primary meaning of limb of a body or figuratively a constituent part. The term occurs also very prominently in early Buddhist literature, where it is part of a compound that designates the eight constituents of early Buddhist of the early Buddhist way to liberation the Noble Eightfold Path, or the Eightfold Path of the Nobles. Although the series of terms that characterizes the auxiliaries of yoga shares only its final component, namely absorption, with its Buddhist analogon, both series serve the same purpose in their respective religious systems. They sketch the aspirant's way to liberation. For the yoga system, this way can be briefly described as follows. At the beginning of his career, the yogi takes up five commitments and five obligations. The commitments consist of the abstention from unethical actions and sexual activity, whereas the obligations are preparatory religious practices. On the whole, it appears that keeping these commitments and obligations is a precondition for a successful spiritual career, insofar as their practice is believed to prevent the acquisition of bad karma, and to support the maturing of good karma towards experiences that are conducive on the way towards liberation. Next, the aspirant completes the keeping of auxiliaries and obligations step by step, 
complements the, uh, the keeping of the commitments step by step with the practice of um, the subsequent ancillaries. The mastering of one ancillary qualifies the yogi to take up the next practice, which leads him gradually to different kinds of mental training, meditation, and finally to absorption. In the ultimate stage of absorption, the yogi gains the liberating insight of the ontological difference between the self and matter. On the backdrop of this outbound of the way to liberation as a stairway on which each step brings the aspirant closer to his goal, it becomes clear that none of the ancillaries of yoga constitutes a religious aim in its own right. The role and meaning of each ancillary in classical yoga is determined by its potential to promote the yogi's spiritual progress towards liberation. With these general considerations in mind, we can now turn to the passage of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra that deals with the practice of posture, which runs from Patanjali Yoga Shastra 246 up to the first part of 249. It commences with the phrase Stira Sukham Asana in uh, Yoga Sutra 246. Philip, can you give us the shloka? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, it has already disappeared again. So, there we have it. So, th this is Yoga Sutra 246. It says um, Stira Sukham Asana, uh, which modern translators have uh, uh, translated as follows. We have a stable and easy posture in the woods. Posture is to be firm and pleasant and legged. Posture should be steady and comfortable and bright. And posture, asana, should be firm but easy, comfortable in Phillips. With the exception of Woods, all translators understand Sutra 246 as a complete sentence that characterizes how posture should be. They apparently overlooked that Sutra 46 is the beginning of a sentence that extends over a parenthesis into the following Sutra 47. The fact that Sutra 46 and 47 form a single syntactical unit is clearly expressed in the beginning of the commentary on 47, where Patanjali remarks that the verb from Bhavati, becomes, arises, has to be supplemented in order to complete a sentence. Leaving aside the exact meaning of the word Stira Sukham for a moment, the two sutras can be translated together with a supplement from the Bhashya as follows. A stira sukha posture arises, completes the sentence, by relaxation of effort or by meditate, merging meditatively in infinity. When interpreted in this way, Sutra 46 does not contain a general characterization of posture, nor does it prescribe any ideal form of posture. It rather teaches that a stira sukha posture arises as the result of two alternative practices. Namely, either as the result of weakening of effort, which probably refers to the keezing of effort that the yogi in his initial state of posture practice has to invest in order to maintain a posture, or as a result of meditative merging in infinity, anantya. The reading, meditative merging infinity, anantya samapati, occurs only in a few manuscripts that preserve an early stage of the transmission, as well as in the oldest commentary on the yoga, Patanjali Yoga Shastra, the Patanjali Yoga Shastra Vivarana, which probably dates from the 7th or 8th century of the Common Era. All other manuscripts and the version that Vajraspati Mishra commented upon around 950 CE attest the deviating reading Ananta Samapati. Vajraspati takes the word stem Ananta, as well as the word Ananta in the Bhashya, to designate the mythical serpent king of the same name, who is believed to live in an underworld where he carries the earth on top of his thousands hoods. Vajraspati explains that the mental organ of the yogi on entering meditatively into Ananta produces the stira posture. If one takes into consideration that meditations on infinity, Anantya, um, play um, an important role in uh, early Buddhist meditation, it appears that the reading Anantya, both in the Sutra and the Bhashya, represents an early stage of textual development, an earlier stage of textual development than the reading Ananta. The available commentaries on Sutra 47 do not explain in any detail how exactly the mind of the yogi produces a stira sukha posture when it merges meditatively into infinity. But I would speculate that this process aims at withdrawing the mind from the perception of the body in order to avoid uncomfortable sensations. 
after having seen that had, how uh, the two sutras 46 and 47 are part of the syntactical unit, we can now proceed to determine the exact meaning of the compound stira sukham that qualifies the word posture in sutra 46. The compound stira sukham is probably a compound adjective consisting of the two adjectives stems, stira and sukham. The dictionary of Monty Williams lists, among others, the meaning firm, not wavering or tottering, steady, or durable, lasting, permanent, changeless for stira. The second part of the compound is the word stem sukha, that means as an adjective, pleasant, agreeable, comfortable. In principle, there are two alternative op op options to analyze this adjective compound. The first is to regard the compound as a descriptive, determinative compound, the so-called kamadaria. The meaning of kamadaria compounds results from an attributive relationship between its two members. In the case of two adjectives, this means that the first adjective is used to qualify the second one verbally. This is exactly how Vachaspati analyzes the compound stira sukha in his gloss of Sutra 46, when he interprets um, it to mean steadily comfortable. Yeah. Vachaspati says, the meaning of the sutra is that posture is steadily, that is unwaveringly comfortable, that is comfort producing. This interpretation of the compound as a descriptive determinative differs markedly from the interpretation of the before cited translations, who analyzed Stira Sukham as a coordinative compound, the so-called Dvandva, in which the meaning of the two word stems is coordinated with the conjunct and. This analysis resulted, for example, in the translations of stable and easy by Woods, firm and pleasant by Leggett, and steady and comfortable by Bryant. Which of the two interpretations is more likely to match the intention of the author of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra? A look into modern Sanskrit grammars shows that the category of compounds consisting of two adjective stems that are formed to express the simultaneous existence of two properties in a noun substantive is slightly contested. According to the grammar of Wakanage, the native Sanskrit grammarians categorize all these adjective compounds as determinative compounds, so-called kamadarayas, whereas modern linguists recognize that coordinative compounds consisting of two or more adjectives actually exist in Sanskrit. Nevertheless, cases in which the attributes are used freely, that is, without any etymologically or semantically relationship to each other, are rare. This means that from a statistical point of view, Vashas Party's interpretation is much more likely to be correct than that of the modern translators. The interpretation of the modern translator matches, however, the interpretation in the oldest and most informative commentary on the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, the before-mentioned Vivarana, which clearly takes the compound Stira Sukham to be coordinative when it crosses it with Stiram Sukham Cham Asana. Um, posture is steady and comfortable, and explains that one should practice that posture which produces for the person who is in it steadiness of mind and body, and which does not cause distress. Moreover, Vijnana Bhikshu, whose commentary uh, we see here, the 16th century, uh, century commentator of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, provides a similar explanation of Stira Sukham when he explains uh, the Sutra as uh, posture is what is steady, that is unwavering and comfort producing. Besides the two interpretations of Stira Stukam discussed so far, there's a third alternative that can be derived from an analysis of the parenthesis that in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra separates this Sutra 46 from 47. This parenthesis consists of a list of 13 names of postures, which ends with the statement that the list comprises only some, but not all, established names of postures. The list runs in translation as follows. So we have the, the lotus posture, the good fortune posture, the hero posture, the lucky mark, the stuffed posture, the supported, the couch, sitting like a saros crane, sitting like an elephant, sitting like a camel, remaining flat, constant serenity, and the very to this is steady and comfortable, stirasuka, and finally as is comfortable, yatasuka, and so on. This list is transmitted in the manuscripts and printed editions of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra that I've collated so far with only two major textual variants. 
First, the name Hero Posture is missing in manuscripts and printed editions transmitting the Valved version of the Pathanja Yoga Shastra. From the fact that the Hero Posture occurs in all the other witnesses, and that the word Hero Posture is commented upon in all available commentaries on the Pathanja Yoga Shastra, it appears that the word was simply omitted in an early exemplar of a sub branch of the Northern Transmission. The second major variant concerns the name Constant Serenity that appears as number 12 on the list. This name, which occurs exclusively in comparatively ancient palm leaf manuscripts of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra from South India and from Jain libraries in the North, represents clearly an early stage of transmission, an earlier stage of transmission than its variant steadily or steady and comfortable that we find in all other manuscripts. The reading constant serenity is preferable because the word serenity, asapti, virtually does not exist in classical Sanskrit. The word occurs, as far as I can see, only in Buddhist Sanskrit texts like the Bodhisattva Bhumi. It is therefore much more likely that this unusual expression, serenity, was replaced in the course of the transmission with the more usual word comfortable, sukha. The second dairy really reading steady and comfortable also seems to be the textual basis of Vajra's Pati Mishra's commentary, as it appears in printed edition. The oldest known manuscripts. I'm sorry. Mm. The oldest known manuscripts of this commentary, the palm leaf manuscripts from Jai Samya, that can be probably dated to the year 1143 of the Common Era, supports, however, the reading Constant Serenity also for Vajra's Pati Mishra's commentary. Because of the rareness of the word serenity in classical Sanskrit, it was replaced in Vajra's Pati Mishra's commentary, like in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, with the reading steady and comfortable. This reading was, however, the one that Woods found in the printed edition, um, found in the printed edition of the manuscripts of Vajra's Pati Mishra's commentary and of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra when he prepared his translation of the works early on in the uh, 20th century. He therefore interpreted the expression steady and comfortable in Sutra 46, not as an adjective that refers to the word posture, but as a noun substantive that stands in apposition to posture. This explains why instead of providing a translation of the compound, he simply rendered it as stable and easy, uh, joined by hyphens, as you remember. In view of the fact that the reading steady and comfortable is secondary in the list of postures, as well as in the text of Vajraspati's commentary, the interpretation of Stira Sukham in 46 as a noun substantive that is used as a technical name for a post posture or for the posture by excellence is highly unlikely to match the authorial intention. The Patanjali Yoga Shasta does not provide any additional information on how exactly the 13 postures that the work lists are to be practiced. It confines itself to mention in 48 that the effect of posture practice uh, in general is being not harmed by the pairs of opposites, like heat and cold, that apparently may affect the yogi during his practice. It therefore appears that the posture practice in classical yoga serves the purpose of immunizing the yogi against sensations Uh, that may distract him while he practices breath control and meditation, which will the next stage of the practice of the series of yoga. The very rare information on how exactly postures were practiced in classical yoga is to some degree supplemented uh, by the information provided by the commentaries, an analysis of which would lead too far in the present context. The Vibhavana provides, however, a brief account of the context in which postures are to be practiced. There we read. In this connection, in a pure camp, temple, in a mountain cave, or on the sandbank of a river that is not close to fire or water, where there are no people, and that is free from evil, the pure person should sip water properly. He should bow to the Supreme Lord, the one Lord of the whole world, to the other revered masters of yoga, and to his own teacher. Facing east or north, he should take up his position on a seat that causes no discomfort, covered with cloth, antelope skin, kusha grass, and assume one of the following postures. And then the description of the individual postures starts. From this brief account, which appears to be an elaboration of the yogic instruction in Bhagavad Gita 6, 10 to 11, to which I shall come back in a minute, 
We learn that the place of posture practice should either be a temple, a mountain cave, or a sandbank of a river that fulfills a number of requirements. The place should be located in some distance to fire and water and other people, probably in order to provide security and a lack of distraction for the yogi during his practice. Moreover, the place for posture practice has to be free from evil, nirangana, and should be ritually pure, shuchi. The last mentioned requirement also applies to the yogi, who even has to increase the ritual purity that he constantly keeps as one of his commitments by sipping water in a ritually prescribed manner. Next, the yogi ritually secures the success of his posture practice by venerating the Supreme Lord, other reverend masters of yoga, and his own teachers. Facing east or northward, he places himself on a comfortable seat, Vishtara, that is covered with cloth, antelope skin, and kushakas. This makeup of a seat corresponds exactly to the prescriptions of Bhagavad Gita 6, 10 to 11, where we read, After having prepared himself in a pure region, a firm seat, which is neither too high nor too low, on which he places cloth, an antelope skin, and kushagas, the yogi should always concentrate himself while he remains in solitude, alone, controlling mind and body, without any wishes and property. It was, as was highlighted in an article by Wunzlam ago in 1968, the three substances of kusha grass, cloth and antelope skin are used individually or in some combination in several Brahmanical ritual contexts, mainly initiation and consecration diksha rituals. Angelika Malina has argued that the substance is used as covers of the yogi seat clearly point to a ritual dimension of yoga in the Bhagavad Gita. On the backdrop of the description of the Vivarana, this even more holds good for the role of posture practice in classical yoga. The ritual dimension of posture is indicated by the characterization of the space for meditation as being ritually pure, by the ritual purity of the yogi, by the use of substances that cover the yogic seat, by the prescription to venerate the gods and teachers of the yoga tradition, as well as by the prescription to face east or northwards. From this characterization of the preliminaries of posture practice, it appears that for the author of the Vivarana, posture practice, breath control and meditation were religious rituals that required a self-consecration of the yogi. This attitude apparently was shared by the anonymous, by the anonymous author of the Nalgenda Tantra, an early a quite early uh, Shaiva Siddhanta text. There we read that a person is healthy because he eats wholesome food. Once his previous meal is digested, should position himself facing north with a good asana in a house surrounded by three walls or somewhere else, like in a forest where he is undisturbed. He should bow to Shiva, Uma, Skanda and Ganesha, then with his neck, head and chest straight both eyes fixed upon the tip of his nose, he should protect his testicles from his heels, he should not touch his upper with his lower teeth. With the body rigid, the person is well positioned and holds his tongue between his teeth. Then he should expel his breath through one of his nostrils to the full extent of his power. The commentator Narayana Kanta explains that the word asana in the Mirena Tantra passage may refer either to a seat covered with cloth and antelope skin, or to one of the yoga postures like, for example, the lotus, lakima, or the half moon, half moon postures that are, according to Narayana Kanta, described in certain other scriptures. The identification of these other scriptures, if it should be possible at all, is a matter of future research. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions. If someone wants to bring up something, yes. Does this imply, with protecting the testicles, does this imply that women are not to be doing this practice? <laughs> yes, uh, in its original context, I, I said uh, this at the beginning of my presentation, that classical yoga addresses exclusively male brahmins. Women don't play any role. The, the term yogini does not occur in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. It's clear that it's only male practitioners and only from a certain uh, social background who are allowed to, to enter this, uh, this way. So. Thank you. Stay on. Well, I, I remember from talking with you uh, and 
an earlier occasion, I think it was in Poland, and you're quite convincing about, um, I think your, your best argument about putting Patanjali and, and Vyasa together is as you look at the manuscripts, it's very hard to tell what's sutra and what's commentary. Uh, and, but, you know, there was a, there was a great advocate of, uh, of yoga named George Feuerstein, who wrote, uh, I don't know, yeah. several books, yeah. and, and yeah. very, very popular in uh, yoga teacher training courses. And, and, and he, of course, his, his, uh, he made a big deal about uh, separating Vyasa and, and Patanjali. Uh, now, what, it seems to me that, that what you say is, is correct about... Uh, the, the unity of the text in the commentary. However, you also said at the very beginning of your talk that you see the Yoga Sutra as incorporating some earlier material. Uh, and just, you know, as we have a, you know, in modern editions where the sutras are highlighted and the, and the Bhasha is clearly separated, there are numerous occasions, I can give you some very concrete examples if you'd like, where um, Vyasa does seem to run off in a very different direction than the intent of the, uh, of the sutra itself, particularly in some of the Siddhi sutras. Uh, uh, maybe, for example, there's the one where, I think it's 317, where from a certain kind of sayama on um, words and meanings and their representations, you understand the cries of animals. Mm -hmm. Where, where uh, you know, what Vyasa says and, and Vajaspati and the classical commentators takes us into the classical theory of meaning and how, how words come together to make a sentence and, and seems hardly related to understanding the cries of animals. So there does seem as though um, Vyasa or potentially Vyasa did feel some constraint to include as sutras, and you did suggest that, and I'm, I'm saying that maybe there's a tension in what you're saying with, on the, on the one hand, you're saying there's this older preserved material, and, and, and then you're saying that, well, no, potentially in Vyasa, the same person. Uh, maybe, maybe you could say a little bit more about that tension. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this uh, question. And, uh, I, I have been thinking about uh, presenting a completely different talk here, which addresses this question, but I, because I have written about this previously, um, in, uh, I thought it would be too repetitive to do this again. Uh, but uh, I'm very much willing to answer your question and do so as briefly as I can because it requires uh, some uh, argumentation. I think the first thing uh, we have to uh, question ourselves um, about is uh, the conception of authorship. What is an author? Yeah? Who, what did this person do who composed this Shastras? What was their own contribution? How were they committed to their tradition? And what did they do? in the moment of composition. I would say that is something completely different from what we nowadays assume to be an author who creates more or less, I mean, the, the theory of intertextuality goes in a different direction, but uh, we see the contribution as something original, you know, uh, uh, connected to a certain individual. Maybe this person did not see this in the same way as we do it nowadays. So with regards to the, the, um, the composition of the, of the Yoga Sutra, clear that the Yoga Sutras were never intended when they were composed in the way that we know them now, as an individual text. Uh, there, is, there are sutras uh, which contain references with personal pronouns that have to refer to something which uh, is mentioned previously, which do not have any referent in the sutra text. They refer to a Basha passage, and uh, the Basha highlights this, uh, and uh, if you, you ask whether this information is credible or not, you see that uh, it's, it's a masculine pronoun, tasya, um, and all the other uh, nouns uh, in, in the pre preceding sutras, they are all feminines. So this tasya uh, has to refer to something else, and that clearly shows to me that the sutras were not uh, meant to be uh, a separate text for, for themselves. The other thing is, uh, and that has something to do with cognitive psychology, um, namely that it's very, very difficult for us and for everybody, to uh, correct something that we have learned in the textbooks. So if we look into uh, history of Indian philosophy, whatever volume we take, we see that there was a, a, um, a sutras by Patanjali and a commentary by Vyasa. And what I uh, try to do is to look 
what, what is the evidence for this? Where does it come from? It comes from Colebrook, yeah, who had some, some, some manuscript. Then it comes uh, down to the Savadarshana Sangraha, 14th century text. And before this, we have other uh, evidences, so say, uh, side Barsha passage with Iti Patanjali, for example. So if we would not have uh, our textbooks and would try to evaluate the different pieces of evidence that we have, I think, yeah, this is my conclusion, that, that, the, uh, that the balance is clearly in favor of, of a joint composition of both uh, constituents uh, of, of the text. And I, I still have the I still have the uh, the openness uh, to um, yeah, consider arguments in the opposite direction. But up to now, as far as I can see, there are many arguments in favor of the fact that this uh, was composed as, as a unified whole, and there's very meager evidence for uh, uh, a distant uh, composition. This. But it, this cannot be discussed without going into the texts, yeah, and definitely not uh, conclusively discussed in, in the context of this uh, of your question. So, so, Philip, along those lines, would you then be inclined to say that the four padas themselves are one complete text? And again, going back to this issue, I think there are arguments to say the iti at the end of the third pada indicates that there was a conclusion there once, and we had addition there. Or, again, to invoke Feuerstein, Feuerstein thought the Kriya Yoga and the Ashtanga Yoga were perhaps different yogas that had been combined. And the, the second point, though, too, I'm wondering what your view is on the degree to which either the Sutrapatta or the Bhashya itself is a hybrid Sanskrit, and to what extent, you know, perhaps we need to be a little bit careful about looking at the grammar as necessarily definitive of the meaning, if you know what I mean. Was the, was the original Sutrapatta or the Bhashya written grammatically by people who were very consistent, or was you know, there a little bit of creep there towards a, a sort of hybridized Sanskrit where maybe keeping the gender straight from, from verse to verse wasn't as important? Okay, there's uh, two, two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, your second question. I'm deeply convinced that it's necessary uh, to consider grammar if you want to understand the text. Uh, uh, but I agree that uh, in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra there are some Buddhist hybrid forms that we can see. Is Paskapti is, is one, one example of this. And I would also be willing uh, to uh, consider um, uh, non Paninian uh, grammatical usages as a, a meaningful means to interpret uh, the Sutra. But then, yeah, we, we have to come up with examples, parallel passages, discuss, and, and not just say, okay, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not so clear, it's not so consistent. I think we have to base our argument uh, on something, and, and that's, uh, that's grammar. Um, your first question, uh, which also consists of uh, several sub-questions, uh, and I'll start with answering uh, uh, the one uh, with regard to the, the Pada structure. Uh, I mean, as long as we accept the pada structure, we have to accept that these are four. Yeah, the pada is a foot. Yeah, and uh, animals have four feet, and uh, the Patanjali Yoga Shastra would be an animal with three feet if we say that uh, <laughs> it's uh, stopped after the uh, third pada. And I think this uh, argument was uh, simply devised uh, by uh, people who wanted to keep the Yoga Sutra and the Patanjali Yoga Shastra uh, apart from uh, references to Vijnana uh, to um, Vijnana Vada. That means to Yoga Chara Buddhism. And then it's possible to, to trace it, to put it back very, very early in history, and that's the, um, the theory uh, of authenticity by, by creating a, a long, long history for it. I think that that's, uh, uh, um, that doesn't hold good. So there must be a four part structure as long as we uh, consider uh, the text uh, to be the colophons to be authentic. And there is no no uh, no indication if you look at the manuscript that the, the work consists of uh, only of three parts, or that uh, the, the colophons are later editions or stuff like this. Uh, then the question of uh, um, whether the Patanjali Yoga Shastra is a compilation, or the Yoga Sutra a compilation of different texts. This is something that we find uh, uh, right uh, from the beginning in the in Yoga studies, starting with Doyson, who identified five different texts um, and said that they were put together more or less uh, mechanically. 
Well, this early Indologists or Orientalists, as they are frequently called nowadays, uh, mm -hmm. they were not very much uh, aware of methodological issues. Yeah? Dawson, Garbe, Bödling, they had an idea of the development of philosophy in general, and they had an idea of what to expect from Indian philosophy. And they were willing to change the texts according to their own ideas. Yeah? And I think this is not, not a, a solid uh, historical methodology. We should look at what we have and interpret this, and then from there we can draw a conclusion and not go with our preconceived uh, ideas to uh, the sources, and, and then change the, uh, the sources according to what we think is, uh, um, is in them. So the iti at the end of the third pada uh, is one example of uh, a large amount of itis uh, in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, which are difficult to explain actually. I was <laughs> just recently discussing with Dominic writing a paper with the title "Too Many Itis." <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, because it's it's the case we have um, references to other texts, we have citations, uh, we have uh, um, yeah. Clear citations, references, fragments, citations of texts which we know, citations of texts which are lost. But in between, we, we uh, some at sometimes also come to passages which are simply yeah, have an iti there, and we don't know where does it come from. Did scribes insert these itis because there were so many and they did this mechanically every now and then, or uh, does it show something about the structure of the text? Is it maybe much more a compilation of all the texts than than uh, we even think today? Was the role of Patanjali very marginal? Did he to, uh, simply put together um, what, what he thought would be uh, yeah, an exposition of yoga? But still, if he only worked as a reductor, there is an idea uh, that is comparable to the idea of an author behind it. Because what he created is something new, even if he took pieces. He did not do this mechanically, but he wanted to, to create an authoritative account of what yoga is based on the Sankhya philosophy. And as thus, thus uh, the, the text, uh, the work was then also received uh, through a long, long time in, in, in intellectual and philosophical history, which we can see from the many, many citations of the work in, in other philosophical works. Yeah, I wanted to just um, ask about the analysis that I've done of uh, four places in the text where the, what's attributed to the us seems to, in some ways, detract from the main argument of Sankhya. So there's the, the three types of yogi, his descriptions of samapati, which get sort of convoluted about the seer saying that there's one samapati with the seer, another with the process of seeing, another with the process of that which is seen. Yeah, in the Samadhi Pada, uh, 43 Pada. following. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then uh, the, his, his description of the number seven, and it just seems that he introduces material that is um, from somewhere else that doesn't necessarily relate in the second pada also. And then in the third pada, rather, again, this is, um, yeah, in the third pada, where he's talking about uh, Viveka Kyati, and again, it's clear that the Sankhya argument is about Purusha and Prakriti, but the examples that he uses do not seem to relate philosophically to the, the vector of the text. Absolutely, I think Bexler has written about this. You are talking about the ninefold causes uh, which, which are mentioned. Yes, yes, uh, I agree. But um, Bexler showed that these passages uh, integrated from some Buddhist uh, background, mm -hmm. uh, which probably at that time was uh, represented the, start, the state of art, uh, of, of logic. So uh, it, was, uh, it was used, I think, I would say, by Patanjali uh, to give an example that he is on the height of the philosophical discussion. Uh, and therefore, he showed which kinds of, uh, uh, which, which, which kinds of causation uh, there are accepted in general by philosophers. Mm -hmm. uh, although, you're absolutely right, they, they, uh, they contradict uh, the, the idea of Parinama Vada yeah, very, very clearly. Yes, I agree that there are, ten that there are tensions between uh, the Basha text and the Sutra text, uh, absolutely. Uh, but I would suggest, as a first step maybe, to accept the work as a, as a whole and then ask, so why, what are the reasons for these tensions? Um, so, uh, well, was there maybe an author authoritative formulation that has to be used as a Sutra? And uh, because everybody knew it, and then uh, he wanted to give it a new interpretation for his for his own uh, yoga, 
Or was it the case that his background suggested that he had to introduce some material in, in order to be, to be uh, at, at the top uh, of, of the discussion, as I suggested there? I think there are many reasons. And I think a good, good, good approach is to take um, the, uh, the idea behind this work seriously, yeah? not to separate it into little tiny pieces saying these are five different works they were put together mechanically, this person did not know uh, anything about yoga, and uh, uh, because this opens up uh, the course very um, frequently, the, the way to projecting one's own philosophical uh, views upon the sutra, because the sutra itself is, uh, has 195 very brief sentences. If you don't, uh, with, with Sanskrit words, which have, if you, if you just look into the lexicon, a huge range of meanings. So I think uh, you can only understand Sanskrit text, especially this very brief and condensed sutra text, if you position them somewhere in history, uh, so that you know which meanings are acceptable, which are not, not projecting Vedic meanings on, uh, on in sutra terms. Having a, an eye uh, on, on the Buddhist influences is absolutely crucial for understanding uh, the Patanjali Yuga Shastra. Looking into Edgerton's Buddhist Hyper-Centered Dictionary opens up uh, a lot lot of things. So this is uh, what I simply would suggest how to approach this work. Yeah. And th those are things we will return to. Yes, please. Um, I want to come back to the Stila Sukha and, uh, and, and to ask you to, to clarify your, your move. Maybe I'm too tired from the jet lag so I didn't understand. You come from New York. <laughs> yeah, but I came from Israel to New York. <laughs> So, so you, you, you choose the you chose the most popular popular verse of the Yoga Sutra, which people who, who know nothing about yoga philosophy will, will know from their yoga studios, and you and you, and you offer the philological analysis. And the, my first question is what, what what's the conclusion of the analysis? Because are you suggesting that Stila Sukham is a is a certain type of a asana? And my second question is, I thought that you were taking it as an illustration to show us that, uh, that the philological analysis can, can change the picture in a dramatic way. So, so, so how does it change the, the picture? Dramatic is a big word huh? for philology. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would uh, maybe uh, voice this in a more nuanced way. Um, my conclusion uh, was that uh, it's necessary to read uh, the sutra not in isolation, but uh, first of all together with this Basha part, which says Bhavati uh, Tivakya Shisha, and then it becomes clear that the next sutra 47, which cons uh, consists of two, um, two uh, instrumental duas, that this is not an individual sentence, but that we have here a syntactical unit which uh, stretches from one sutra uh, into the other. And if you read them together, this becomes one sentence. And, th and then, if this is the case, then Sira Sukham is not anymore the general characterization of the idea of posture, but it shows what the result is of a certain kind of practice, namely uh, of merging meditatively into infinity and of the relaxation of effort. So, uh, I don't know whether this is dramatic, but it's a different meaning, and that's, uh, that's all I wanted to suggest, that it's, uh, it pays uh, off to look at the things carefully, that's all. Um, I think uh, Stila Sukham Asanam, like the vast majority of the uh, Yoga Sutra statements, is in the indicative. It's, a, it's when you read it, you know, thought, you feel it is either a statement of fact or a kind of definition. Uh, but what, essentially, what is the uh, speech act of uh, Patanjali uh, in saying Stila Sukham Asana? What does he want, actually? What, is, what, what, what does he do? If you think about such a statement, what, is it just a kind of a scholarly definition of an ideal state of, 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 of in the condition of man, of the practitioner, practitioner, or is it something else? What is actually the flavor of the statement, in a sense that it's not a is it a kind of an observation of an of ideal practitioner? So what is it actually in Patanjali's mind, this uh, kind of statement? What does it do? Is it what kind of a recommendation is this actually, or just a kind of a scholarly uh, definition of uh, of uh, let's say uh, yoga, the perfect yogi like BKS Iyengar? This is how he does it. But when you apply to a, 
a practitioner of yoga and saying stira sukam asanam. What is this actually? Yeah, uh, that, that's uh, that, that's a good question. Why did he formulate it the way he did it? Yeah. Why did he have this uh, second uh, sutra afterwards? And why did he leave the statement uh, un, uh, incomplete by, by not putting the verb into it? Which he does uh, frequently, by the way. So first of all, I think stira sukha asana evokes uh, a certain association, an association uh, which we also find in the Bhagavad Gita, where the, where the seat asana is actually described as something which is comfortable and uh, not too high, not too low, stable. So we have this double meaning. First of all, asana the seat, and then asana the practice. And what uh, um, uh, Patanjali is doing, probably he is uh, first evoking this uh, impression of, of a seat, and then he's turning it into a practice. And I think that uh, posture practice may have been something uh, comparatively new at his time that there was a, a large variety of uh, different postures that could be assumed for meditation. Because if we look at uh, the earliest contexts in which uh, meditation, and for which we have sources for how people meditate, that is in the, in the Buddhist Pali Canon, uh, there's usually just one term that is used that is palankam, you know, or pariankam in Sanskrit, yeah, that is sitting cross leg. Also a very difficult term, and it also occurs uh, pariankam as one of the, these postures there, there it is described completely differently from what we find in the, in the Buddhist context. And then if we see it located in the, in the Gupta time, 4th century, I would say um, that here uh, something new is emerging. Yeah? Uh, we, we, uh, we have a, a huge variety of practices that, that are uh, used uh, in meditation. And Patanjali actually does not provide too much uh, um, information about it. For him, it's not, not, a, not uh, too much uh, of an issue. He just says that uh, in the course of practice, of two different practices, when the effort relax or, uh, relaxes or when one uh, merges, concentrates on, on infinity, then posture, which probably in the initial phase is not pleasant and firm, becomes pleasant and firm. And this is also uh, um, supported, this interpretation, by, by, by the Bhashya, where um, stira is glossed by, um, uh, the, uh, by the fact that uh, the, the, the limbs of the body, they stop trembling. And this is an experience that everybody has who, who engages himself physically in a static way, that your limbs start uh, trembling. And only if you're experienced, if you're well trained, yeah, then you can do the practice without, um, uh, without any effort anymore, and then also calmly without uh, treble, trembling of, of your body. Okay, I invite everybody to stand up. <laughs> and to just shake it out. And in the interest of um, lunch upon us, if you need to slip out, feel free to slip out. And it's, I think, wise to move forward. We had a little bit of a mini break before. So what I would like to do is to invite Staneshwar to choose and say also.